Medications work for some people with MS more than others, but why and who and can we know this in advance? I stumbled across this article, which is an absolute gold mine, looking at data from 46,000 people with MS to answer this question and many others. Because remember what William Deming said, in God we trust, all others bring data. So these researchers took data from 61 randomized, controlled, blinded, late stage, phase two and phase three clinical trials. A lot of these studies are very famous and led to these multiple sclerosis drugs getting FDA and EMA approved. There were over 46,000 participants and the average study was around two years. So there are over 91,000 patient years. And some of these studies were against placebo. Some of these studies a drug was compared against another multiple sclerosis drug. And so there were over 9,000 people getting placebo. Now, the point of this study is really that they created an app that allows you to sort of weigh the risk of the medication versus the benefit. And I'll show you that at the very end. By the way, the link in the description below and the link to that application you can use in the description below. But I think the more interesting aspect of this article is just the overall data they provide. But there are a few caveats I should mention. One is that they do some comparison across clinical trials, which is methodologically problematic because every clinical trial is fundamentally different and has a different patient population. And there may be some characteristics that are unknown to the researchers that you can't just correct for. So when you do multivariate analysis to try to correct for confounders, that only allows you to correct for certain known confounders. They're also unknown confounders. The other thing they talk about is the idea of a placebo group in silico. In other words, that didn't exist in real life and is only in the computer algorithm. In other words, let's say you have the drug Ocrevus compared to Rebif in the clinical trials OPERA1 and OPERA2. There's no placebo group. Every single person with MS got a disease-modifying therapy. But if you want to assess how effective is Ocrevus, say, compared to a drug that only had a placebo group, didn't have an active comparator, you can sort of compare across trials and confound for different variables and create sort of a fake placebo group, needless to say, this isn't perfectly accurate. So take that sort of analysis with a grain of salt. Nonetheless, most of the claims that I'm going to show you are very well established, known to clinicians with a lot of experience, and recapitulated in various other studies, and I do believe them to be accurate. So the first question, what happens to MRI activity with increasing age, just with the natural history of multiple sclerosis? So this looks at the number of contrast-enhancing lesions, gadolinium-enhancing lesions. When you have a new lesion, there's a breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. The gadolinium dye extravasates in the brain, causing it to light up like so, and this study shows shows that the number of lesions on average per scan decreases with age. And these are baseline scans prior to the initiation of the disease modifying therapy. And in other words, not influenced by the study. In all of these graphs, you'll see the MS type, the circles are relapsing MS, the squares are progressive MS trials, the larger circles and squares are trials with a greater sample size, and color coded is the year published. The dark blue are the earlier trials, the yellow are the more recent studies, the white are in between, and there's a clear trend of decreasing active lesions with age. The same is true for real relapse rate. This looks at annualized relapse rate or relapses per person per year. Let's say one person has four relapses over two years. That would be an annualized relapse rate of two. And you can see younger trials, trials with younger participants have fairly high annualized relapse rates, but progressive MS trials with older participants, it's much, much lower. And this is a very well-known phenomenon. Keep in mind, this is the baseline pre-trial relapse rate, which is very biased because people tend to enter studies after they have a relapse and having recent relapse is part of the entrance criteria into the trials. But this is a very well-known phenomenon that all clinicians know to be true. Relapses naturally decrease with age whether or not you take medication. This is also true during the clinical trial in participants who are randomized to placebo. You can see in this graph, older people who got placebo have lower rates of relapses than younger people who got placebo with quite a bit of trial-to-trial variation. -trial 
variation, but the general trend is clear. Of course, those getting randomized to disease-modifying therapy had fewer relapses overall. Another interesting phenomenon is regression to the mean. These are the yearly relapse rates in three clinical trials in participants who got randomized to placebo. They did not receive disease-modifying therapy. So yellow is one trial, dark blue is another trial, light blue is yet another trial, and in all three trials, the relapse rate starts off high and then goes down. You might think this is cherry-picked data, but this is widely reported in many other clinical trials. It's very well known, and what's simply happening is that people tend to enter trials when they're doing badly, they've had a recent relapse. Also, part of the inclusion criteria of trials is often recent disease activity, and MS is a relapsing and remitting disease. People do often get better, and this is true of various other relapsing diseases. In studies on migraine, often the placebo group does fairly well, though the treatment group may do somewhat better. This is just a regression to the mean phenomenon. So be careful when interpreting non-randomized trials. Let's say there's a non-randomized trial, just no comparison group, and some group gets much better, has dramatically fewer relapses. Well, that may be a natural effect that could be expected even with an ineffective drug. The next thing I want to look at is what is happening with MS over time, not in an individual person with advancing age, but looking at epochs of research, what's happening with the disease overall. It turns out that relapse rates, at least within clinical trials, are decreasing. This is year of publication of the trial on the x-axis versus annualized relapse rate on the y-axis. You can see these earlier studies had very high relapse rates, and now they're much, much lower, often less than 0.5, in other words, averaging less than one relapse per two years. Why is this happening? Well, the diagnostic criteria of MS have changed. It's easier to diagnose milder multiple sclerosis. MRI scans have gotten better. Awareness of multiple sclerosis has gotten better. Also, with these early trials, only people with more aggressive multiple sclerosis were desperate enough to enter these clinical trials. Imagine in, say, 1991, the beta seron trial, no one knew you could even use a drug to treat multiple sclerosis that was proven to be effective. People were very wary, but those with more aggressive MS perhaps were more desperate, but it looks like relapse rates are significantly decreasing. Now, relapses don't necessarily translate into overall disability. However, the rate of disability progression in these trials is also decreasing. This is looking at confirmed disability progression versus publication year on the x-axis. And confirmed disability progression means that someone has a certain level of disability, typically measured by the EDSS, Expanded Disability Status Scale, and they have a follow-up clinic visit and they're worsened. And it's not just random fluctuation or a temporary worsening due to a relapse because on yet another follow-up visit, they still have not recovered. Hence, it is confirmed progression of disability. And the average rate of disability progression, and you can see there's a wide range in the individual trials, does seem to be decreasing over time. And this is highly statistically significant. You can see the p-value is 0 0.0003. So it's a real phenomenon. MS seems to be getting milder, at least within these clinical trials. And by the way, there does seem to be some correlation between relapses and confirmed disability progression. You can see relapses on the x-axis versus confirmed disability progression in these trials on the y-axis. There is a correlation. Obviously, there's a lot of scattering, but it does seem that relapses do mean something and do translate into real long-term disability in some people, at least to some extent. Obviously, there's this concept of progression independent of relapse activity, so relapses aren't the only thing, but relapses do matter. But the authors are trying to argue this perhaps controversial idea that inflammatory activity, relapses and contrast-enhancing lesions on MRI, are driving more of disability progression earlier in the disease, but later on they're less important. Now, of course, this is an exaggeration. There's not a sharp cutoff like this. Inflammation perhaps always matters to some extent, but they're trying to make a point about weighing the risks versus the benefits.
So let's move on to predictors of disability and predictors of efficacy of different multiple sclerosis medications. So this suggests that higher relapses portend that medications are more effective. So the x-axis is the baseline rate of relapses, and on the y-axis is the percentage of confirmed disability progression reduction relative to placebo. Now, not all of these trials are placebo-controlled trials, so there's this concept I mentioned before of in silico placebo, which isn't exactly real. So take this with a grain of salt. But overall, the trend is clear when the baseline relapse rate is higher, excuse me, higher is on the x-axis, the percent reduction relative to placebo is greater. So this line would be 50% reduction in progression of disability compared to placebo, which may not actually be a real placebo. Whereas drugs that are used in trials with very low rates of relapses didn't seem to show great efficacy. This slide compares the rate of disability progression in those getting the placebo on the x-axis compared to the matched group in the same trial getting the active treatment, the multiple sclerosis drug. Now, let's say all of these drugs were completely ineffective. You would see the bubbles line up on this dashed line. And of course, most of them are below that because most of these drugs do have evidence of reduced disability progression compared to placebo. However, in many cases, it's not that much lower. Also, there's a lot of variation in the individual trials. Now, of course, the bubbles that are very far far below the lines suggests that it was quite effective. However, it suggests that the baseline characteristics, in other words, having the right type of multiple sclerosis, being the right person who has a lower rate of disability progression, is actually more important than being on the right drug. So it's better to be lucky than good when it comes to multiple sclerosis. Some people just have a lower tendency to have progression of disability. So let's take a look at some of the individual factors which predict response to medication. So this is looking at the percentage change in confirmed disability progression relative to placebo in different trials. Each circle or square represents an individual trial. And this is only in placebo-controlled trials. So we're avoiding this in silico placebo group methodology. And this looks at disability as measured by EDSS. Higher EDSS means greater disability. Six means a cane is required to walk 100 meters. Three would be mild to moderate disability. And you can see people who were less disabled tended to have a greater reduction in disability with the drug in that trial, and the drugs were less effective in with people with more existing disability. Not necessarily they did not benefit, but it was less beneficial on average in people who had more existing disability. Here we look at age and advancing chronological age, not duration of disease, just time since birth. The drugs tend to be a little bit less effective, though it's not a huge effect, and some older people still could benefit fit from the medications. I know a lot of people get offended when I post data like this. Of course, it's disconcerting that some people may be less likely to benefit from these medications, particularly older people with progressive MS. But I think it's very important to know, considering the risks of some of these medications. But you can see overall, young people tend to benefit a little more than older people with a wide range based on the individual drug and the individual trial. Treatment duration also seems to be a factor, which is, of course, correlated with age, people who are just starting on medication or haven't been treated for that long tend to benefit more. People who have been on treatment for a long time tend to benefit less on average. And for disease duration, there's also a general trend. People who have had MS for longer tend to benefit a little bit less on average from these medications. So now we move to the risk of the medications. And the authors of the study make the point that people with MS have an increased risk of infections and even serious infections that can cause major comorbidity, or even death. And so this looks at the rate of infections causing death in different age groups, and it's very low in young people, but increases as you get older, particularly in the 65 plus age group. So white is the general US population, light yellow is people with MS, and the darker yellow is people with MS who have ever taken a medication. Now there's not necessarily a huge difference there, but then they look at how sick you are. So they use the Charlson comorbidity index and 
One would be you have fewer serious medical conditions like hypertension, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, congestive heart failure, that type of thing, versus index two having more of these medical conditions. They look at people who have had prior hospitalization for infection and people who just have more disability overall, EDSS, greater than six, meaning that you need some walking aid to walk long distances. And you can see the risk of infection leading to death can be quite significant. And there is overall a difference in mortality in people with MS, mortality rates compared to the general population. This is from social security data. You can see in younger people, the mortality rates are fairly low, but in older people with MS, mortality rates are greater than the general population, a little bit more in men than in women. And a lot of this is due to the increased risk of specific conditions such as blood clots due to immobility and infections. And in fact, infections make a major component of the excess comorbidity and mortality in people with MS compared to the general population. Keep the specific data with a grain of salt as mortality seems to be declining a little bit in people with MS relative to the general population, which is good news, but it's still not the same. It's still a little bit higher. And by the way, you can look up your expected lifespan according to the Social Security Administration. This is just an example of data for people age 50 to 60, both men and women. I'll include the link to the full data in the notes below. But if you really want, you can check out this website. Again, link in the description below. This is sort of summarizes all their data and allows you to look for the data on a specific medication with specific baseline characteristics based on modeling. I definitely wouldn't recommend making any actual decisions based on it. So let's say I'm looking at the drug alentuzumab, which is Lymtrada. Let's say I want to make someone an ideal candidate, an 18-year-old with no disability, who had a really high relapse rate, newly has multiple sclerosis, has a lot of enhancing lesions, then the drug looks very effective, like 64% effective if we assume that treatment prevents and doesn't just delay disability. But let's say I choose a more modestly effective medication. Hey, why not Tysabri in this study? Because they think that it's more modest. I can choose an 80-year-old, even though there's no actual study with 80-year-olds who's had MS for a long time and who has really high disability and no relapses and no active lesions. It's going to tell me that the drug is completely ineffective. Of course, this isn't based on actual data on 80-year-olds. It's just made up based on modeling. So again, I really wouldn't recommend making actual decisions based on this. You can also go to the risk tab and look at your risk of getting infections. So let's say I want to make the person 55 years old. They weren't previously hospitalized with infection. They have previously used disease-modifying therapies. They are ambulatory, don't need a cane. And maybe they have a few medical conditions Let's say they have diabetes, for example, but nothing else. You can see this is the risk of death due to infection in the long term and the remaining life expectancy. Again, I don't think this is particularly accurate either because everyone is different and everyone has minor comorbidities and this data is constantly changing. If you look at it even 20 years ago, it might be significantly inaccurate and probably quite pessimistic in my opinion. But despite my skepticism of this aspect of the article, Article, I give the authors full credit for publishing an awesome article with tons of interesting data and going through all the trouble to look through all of those articles and create these beautiful graphs, which were very informative to me and hopefully to you. Let me know if you have any questions about it in the comments below or other remarks or ideas for future videos.